new story. I'm so blessed to be here and to launch of a, a, brand, a brand new sermon series. Uh, before I do, I just do want to say uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm grateful for this particular man in my life. Um, he was my senior pastor uh, for the time that I was here in L.A. I was born and raised here, and, um, and I was a new Christian, a growing Christian, and he took me under his wings. And, you know, now we look at our church, and we planted it 13 years ago. It's a multicultural church, and it's, it's growing everywhere. We're going to plant our, our fourth and fifth campus at the end of this year, and the Lord has done much work. And, and when you see from the external uh, just the things that God is doing, it's often like so quick to, people are so quick to attribute all the stuff to uh, the guy, the main guy. And what I want to remind all of us is, number one, there's not a guy besides Jesus that we should celebrate here on Sunday. But also, if there is somebody else that we should honor um, always know that, you know, people that you look at, they've always stood on the shoulders of other people. That, you know, faith and the torch of faith has been passed on to us. And certainly, uh, Pastor Stephen is that person in my life. Uh, I've had the great privilege of being an associate pastor under his leadership. And could I just tell you um, about your pastor just real quick? Number one, I don't know a greater man that actually lives uh, in private the same way he lives in public. He's the same guy. And secondly, that uh, he loves the people of his church. And um, I've seen him grieve. I've seen him pray for you. I've seen him long for you in ways that you're not privy to. And um, because he's a man who's deeply in love with every single member here at New Story. And so would you just thank him for your pastor? Would you just thank him and say, and then we're, we're so blessed to have you as our pastor. And I, I certainly am too. Hey, I'm starting a brand new series, and, um, and what I want to do is I want to bring to a, a, a topic, a, a very important one that I think we all struggle with. You know, when you look at the book of Romans, and in particular chapter 5, 6, and 7, you'll see a repeated pattern that Paul says, and the reason why he says it over and over again is because we don't get it, and he starts by saying that we're once enslaved to Adam because Adam is our forefather, and much of his sins have come and resided in us until Jesus Christ saved us. And when he saved us, then he, we, he gave us the empowerment of the resurrection to which he experienced himself. And as the tomb was rolled away, he was set free in the same way we are set free now. We're no longer enslaved to Adam, but we're in a bond servant of Jesus Christ's relationship. Amen? And because of this relationship, we are now set free. And that now we don't have like a jail cell with the prisoner doors closed. It is flung wide open. And yet many of us, even as witnessing, professing Christians, still choose to live in the prison when we're no longer chained by our past. And so what I want to talk about today is something that we've been set free from, and yet we continue to live as if we're chained to the past, which is the topic of worry. Now, I know you worry, uh, some of you on occasion, a lot of you worry constantly. You worry about the school that you're going to get into. You worry about children going to a different foreign country. You worry about, you know, maybe the job that you might have, or you want to keep the job, or you might be looking for a career. You might be worried about that. Maybe starting a family. Maybe you're single, and you're looking for a, a family to start, and you're like, man, I'm worried. What does my future look like? Maybe if you're a parent, you're constantly and incessantly worried about the outcome of your children and the decisions that they make. And maybe you're concerned about your financial future. Did I save enough? Am I ready for retirement? These are real issues that people have. And we're constantly worried and worried and worried. Can I just ask here, what are your chief worries today? What are you worried about? Well, it would help to actually start out with a working definition of worry. And this is the definition of worry. Worry is a constant preoccupation with an unknown future. It's a constant preoccupation with a future that you don't know, and you so prefer that it goes one direction, but you don't know because you and I are not in control of that, and so we worry and worry and worry. And what's fascinating about worry is worry is not a force. It's not an energy, and yet we continue to do it, and oddly, we think the more we do it, we move the needle somehow. Isn't that true? 
It just seems like if we worry and worry and worry, somehow we'll change the predicament. Well, what's strange about worry is it has no actually power to cure a disease or solve a problem, yet we do it. And you know, 90% of the things that we worry about won't even happen. In fact, Mark Twain once said, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which have never happened. And so when we worry, it's kind of like paying for a really expensive gym membership that we never work out in, right? We're like, we're doing the work and no, no results, right? It's like you paying for a subscription that you don't even know you have. And that's the worst, right? We're wasting our energy. We're wasting our resources. And let me just dig further. Worry, the word worry, it comes from an Anglo-Saxon word meaning to strangle, now, isn't that a great word picture, to strangle? Because that's exactly what worry does. You know, it strangles us spiritually. It strangles us emotionally. It actually even strangles us physically. Would you know that 75% of all of hospital visits that we have are related to some sort of worrying or anxiety? And so this is greatly tied. And so let me just share with you how worry works, okay? Like, so in my 50s now, I've always enjoyed extreme sports, and in my 50s now, I do CrossFit, and it's something that seems extreme to me, so I like it. In my 20s, I started by doing um, competitive eating. You know, I used to love competitive eating. I, I ate steaks and hot dogs and whole butter and oysters and whatever it was. I, I did that, just it felt extreme. And in my 30s, when I got married, my wife gave me great advice and said, stop it. And so that's how, she said, stop it. And I'm like, all right, okay, so what am I going to do then? She's like, well, you know, get into something different, mellow, you know, exercise, go mountain biking. So I knew one guy that knew how to mountain bike. So I'm like, would you take me mountain biking? He said, sure. So he took me to the mountain, the top of Angeles Crest, just right up here. He took me up there. It took him like 30 minutes. It took me four hours. But anyway, I got up there. And up there, he actually showed me the trail that we're going to go. It was called El Prieto. Maybe you're familiar with it. I didn't know then. I know now. It's translated as the dark side. That's what, you know. And what my imagination was in actually going mountain biking is that I would have a bike with a basket right in front with some baguette and some butter and some wine. And we just roll down the hill nice and gently and eventually, you know, ring my bell and, you know, and then stop and enjoy a little picnic, get back on and, you know, have a scenic route. No, this this path uh, was a single track, which means that the path uh, to which I was going to go down is as wide as this podium. It's very narrow. It's treacherous. There are drops. There are huge rocks. There are roots exposed all the way around. They're completely, as for an expert, like triple diamond. And I was more like, I don't know, a bronze. And so I just was not ready to go on this thing. And he said, hey, just follow me. And he just took off in a cloud of dust and disappeared and left me alone. What a friend, right? And so I tried my very best to navigate this thing, and I hit every tree, every rock, every root, every switchback. I fell and fell and fell a few times, times 100. And I was bloodied up, muddied up, and I was wounded. I ended up walking the bike down majority of the trail until the very end when it opened up. All my friends were waiting for me on the other side, like the image of my end of my life. You know, they're like, come on, man. It's all good here. Come on through. And I walked my bike in incredible frustration and anger. And, and I, I looked at my friend, and he said, and he had the audacity to say to me, he said, um, how was it? <laughs> and um, I, after I said, I hate you, I'm like, did you see all the rocks? Did you see all the roots? Did you see all the switchbacks? He said, yes. I'm like, how do you not hit them? He goes, oh, you know what? I should have taught you the first number one rule and the only rule to mountain biking. I'm like, what's that? He's like, whatever you stare at is where you go. That would have been nice to know up the hill. You know what I mean? Then down, wherever you stare at is where you go. And man, what a life principle. Whatever you stare at tends to be the place we navigate our life on. And so when we look at those obstacles and worries, we constantly hit ourselves there. <clears throat> what would it look like for you and I to stare at something different? 
beyond our immediate obstacles, to see beyond. And so that's what we're going to do today. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, would you turn to James chapter 4? <clears throat> and we're going to read starting from verse 13, and we'll read to verse 17. And initially, this seems like a, a pretty mellow verse, pretty self-explanatory, and my, my hope is that we would uncover some nuggets here, but beyond that, that the Holy Spirit preach a better sermon than the one that you're about to hear from me today. James chapter 4, verse 13, it reads like this. It says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to, into such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while, a little time, and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. For whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. That is the word of the Lord for this day. And what I want to do with the remainder of our time is to just draw out three things that enslave us to worry. And then three things that will free us from it. And so if you are taking notes, here's the first implication that we see in this scripture is number one, we forget God. We forget God. That's why we're enslaved to worry today. Look at the scriptures here. Verse 13, come now who you say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Now, this is interesting. It seems on the surface that James is discouraging us of the activity of planning. But this is not what he's saying. James is not prescribing that we, we no longer plan. No, he's saying, no, go ahead and plan. But this is what we often do is that when we plan, we forget about the Lord. And so what James is saying is that go ahead and plan, but always make sure that you plan with the Lord in mind, in mind. Now, this is so natural for us because you and I, we were so uh, inclined to forget God. This is what we do. In fact, I mean, maybe this is a common and shared experience for all of us, especially parents here. Like how many of you uh, have woken up in the middle of the night because you're concerned with something? that you had to worry, and that you wake up, and you have, like, sweat beating down your forehead, and you're like, oh, my gosh, it was just a dream, and I'm worried about it, and you have a hard time sleeping. Now, that's a pretty common occurrence, isn't it? Now, how many times have you actually experienced such utter peace with God that you would wake up in the middle of the night and realize, wow, I have peace with God? Never. And here's my point. What a disproportionate relationship between the energy that we give to worry and actually the experience and the acknowledgement of the presence of God. What happens? We continue to give it away from God. In fact, when we do that, uh, we are actually becoming arrogant is what this verse says. Verse 16 said, when we forget God, we're being arrogant. Verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All boasting is evil is what it says. So to forget God is arrogance, and arrogance is evil. And you might be thinking, man, that's pretty harsh of James to say that. But this is what God wants us to know, um, that there's almost nothing worse than being forgotten. You see, if you're hated, you're still something. But if you're forgotten, that means you're nothing. And this is the reason why uh, one of the greatest Old Testament themes, if you read meta-narratively scripture, you'll see that God continues to say, remember him, remember him. See, don't just think of him on Sundays or before meals. Remember him. And that's why Psalm 9, verse 16 will say, the Lord has made himself known. Remember him. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. You see, just, you're just planning on your own. And so, and all those who forget God. And what does this mean for the wicked? Wicked are people who forget God. Wicked are people who don't acknowledge God every single day. Then it says, but for the needy who remember God, they will not be forgotten. So what does it mean to remember God? 
It means you and I acknowledge that today we're in desperate need of him. We really need him. We're longing for him. The way we ascribe glory to God is to say we are not God. You are. You are in control. We are not. And so we want to involve you. We do not want to forget you. And that's why Jeremiah 2.32, it says, Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Now, this is one of the most sobering realities in Scripture detailing really the window of our heart. And when you look through the window of our heart, we could see our motive. And this passage here is, is marrying two ideas. The first idea is a, a, is a woman who, who is getting married, who will not forget her outfit and her makeup. Why? Listen, I've been a pastor for almost 30 years now, and I've done a lot of weddings since then. And every single wedding I've done, I've never run into the situation where all of a sudden the bride comes down the center aisle and she's like, oh my gosh, I forgot my makeup. Never once. Why? Because what Jeremiah is saying is it's too important for her. She'll never forget. There's not one wedding in the history of the world that has never forgotten the makeup and the adornment that she's wearing. And yet God says, my people will forget me. Here's the principle. If it is important to you, like makeup, your wedding day, you will not forget. God's saying, why have you forgotten me? He says that because maybe perhaps that's revealing something about God, how we view God, that our quick remedy to forget God is really entrusting ourselves, bringing glory to ourselves, giving arrogance upon ourselves, and thus it is evil. And that's why James pulls no punches in verse 17. He says, so, when he says so, he's talking about verse 13 all the way to verse 16. He says, whoever knows the right thing to do, meaning attribute to God and trust God, and yet don't just trust yourself and fails to do it, for him it is sin. It is sin. William Barclay, the great commentary and theologian, says, there must be greater sins than worry, but certainly there's no more disabling sin. It's to say, yeah, there's, there, there are more extravagant, more, more like shock value sin that we commit, but there's not a sin that we commit that is more disabling in the sense of we don't glorify him, we forget him, and therefore we live our lives without him. Here's the second thing that we see here. We not only forget God, then we assume God's place. We assume God's place. Verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all Boasting is evil. And James says here that if you forget God, you are actually boasting in your arrogance, and by definition then, you are assuming God's place. The only place that God should be in the throne of your life, you are putting yourself there. Because when you make plans without God, you're assuming that you know exactly how everything should go. But God's saying, how do you know? You're not me. You're not God. In fact, there's a place in St. Augustine's writing that his most landmark work is a book called Confessions, which actually has eight different books, and it's a collection of incredible theological insight that he wrote long, long time ago, and in it, he says, we're all made in the image of God to reflect him and to resemble him, but Augustine says, but because of our sin, it has now distorted that process, whereas... Interestingly, what happens is now we seek to resemble God in all the wrong ways. And let me show you what that means. I want to show you a diagram here just to illustrate this better. You see, theologians over the years have divided the attributes of God into two categories. One, the communicable attributes. The other, incommunicable attributes. And now we don't use that language anymore unless we're talking about viruses. You know, but but theologians have always talked about this, and communicable attributes are ones that you could catch, the ones that you could grow. And so Augustine says, uh, if, if you actually uh, get closer to God, because we're made in the image of God and to resemble God, then we do become holy. We do become more wise. We do become more gracious, full of wisdom. Those are communicable things. That's like 
We could catch a virus. Remember not too long ago, the coronavirus, that's why many of us wore masks. This is why uh, this church was shut down for a little bit and all that we're like pumping sanitizers into our mouths and doing all these silly things. Remember those days? Why? Because it was communicable. And and God is saying, you see, my attributes of, of holiness, of goodness, of love and grace and wisdom are all communicable. If you come near me, I will give you these things to grow in your life. And then there's another side of things called incommunicable attributes. And these are attributes that speak more to his nature that cannot be passed off. They're incommunicable in in the sense that these are qualities that only God has. Only the creator has. And none of the created has. And yet, what's interesting is all these qualities are usually starting with the word omni, like the prefix of omni like omniscience, which means God knows everything. Omnipotent, meaning he's in power of everything. The, the, the omnipresence, which means he's everywhere all at once. He's never rushing to get somewhere in the world. He's already there. And here's what Augustine is saying. We're made in the image of God actually to reflect him through his communicable attributes. But this is what human beings have said. We're like, nah. Nah. We don't want your communicable attributes. We want your incommunicable attributes. We don't want holiness, wisdom, and love and grace. What we want is your omnis. I want to be omniscient. I want to be omnipresent. I want omnipotence. And this is why when we look at Genesis 3, 4, this is what it says. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. What is that? That's omnipotence. For God knows when you eat of, your, uh, eat of it, your eyes will be opened. That's omniscience. That's knowing everything. And you will be like God. You see, the serpent has tricked us, schemed to help us to believe, make us believe that we should want the omnis, not the communicable attributes, but the incommunicable attributes. And ever since then, instead of trusting the creator, we say, No, that's suspicious to me. I should know. I want the power. I want it to happen right now. And so when we forget God, and when we assume his place, then third, then we're consumed in worry. That's how it works. Do you know what worry is? It is your and my frustrated aspiration towards the incommunicable attributes of God. We're really frustrated. We wish that we could do it all. We wish we really knew. We wish we were in power. You know, worry is like B.O. You know what B.O. is? Body odor, right? Worry is like body odor of a false god. You know why? A real god never sweats, right? Because he's in control of everything. He never sweats. He's never worried. You know who worries? You know who sweats? False gods. False gods. And we sweat. And that's what worry is. Worry stinks. Why? Because fake gods are pretending to be real God. You know, this is why James reminds us in verse 14, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You know what basically James is saying? He's saying, yo, let's remember you and I are nothing. You have the power to last. Well, how long does a mist last? Five seconds? I mean, that's how much power we have. That's how much omnipotence we have. We're nothing. Mist doesn't control anything. And worry comes when mist think that they're gods. This is why you and I worry. You know, Corey Ten Boom once said this, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of his sorrows. It empties today of his strength. Isn't that so true? Are you worried? Well, worry then is you forgetting God, and you assuming God's place. That is the byproduct and the formula of why we are worried. Then the question is, how could we be free from worry? Remember in the beginning, I gave you a mountain bike illustration and the principle? Whatever we stare at is where we go. So isn't this a great principle that every parent tried to teach their kids when they were learning to drive? Look ahead. You know, don't look at the crash right there. Don't look at the squirrel. 
You know, because wherever you turn your head and look at is where you're going to veer towards, right? Look ahead beyond the horizon. And therefore, for Christians, it is imperative. It is significant and important at what we stare at. So could I just prescribe to you three things that we could stare at so that we no longer worry? Number one, stare at God's grace. Would you stare at God's grace? Verse 13, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make a profit. Instead, you ought to say this, if the Lord wills, we will live. Did you hear that? If the Lord wills, we will live. Say live. Live. Do it again. Say live. Live. If the Lord wills, we will live. And essentially what this is saying is the only reason why you and I are here today, why you are here at New Story, you're not by accident. You're not self-sustaining yourself. It's not because you took all your vitamin gummies and drink kombuchas. This is not the reason why you are sustaining yourself. It's not because you are hooked on, you know, all the, you know, the sanitizers and all that stuff. I mean, all those things help, but that's not the reason why you are here. And what's interesting is the people that know that the most are people who have experienced great health trauma. If you know some people who are young and has had health trauma of cancer and different kinds, they're like, man, I thought I was in peak health. And all of a sudden, man, I'm the ripe old age of 32 and I'm really sick and dying. See, so you're not here because you think you're doing all the right things. You are only here because of the will of God. Amen? God has given you breath. God has given you life. God has given you the grace to put you in the position that you are. Not kombucha, that's rotten juice. (laughs) Sorry if I offend you. Jonathan Edwards, the first thing he would say in the morning, he would say himself, he says this, I must remember this, that everything that I enjoy today is actually better than hell, is strictly by the mercy and the graciousness upholding power of God. That's what he would say every single morning. You know, I I have a little post-it on my desk. It says, it's all grace. I deserve far worse. And it's true. Whatever I'm enduring today, you know, I, I don't deserve it. I deserve far worse because God is gracious. It's the only reason why I live. So, so when I'm tempted and being really arrogant in the heights, thinking, you know, it has to go this way. It's all up to me. I say instead, man, God doesn't owe me anything. It's all God's grace. And sometimes when I'm in the valleys, then I say, man, this really sucks. But you know what? I deserve far worse than that. It's all God's grace. So whether I'm in the heights or the valleys, you realize understanding and staring at God's grace makes me impervious to circumstances. That's what it is, I feel like. And this is why, remember Paul says, you know, I, in every situation, I've learned the secret of being content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to be brought to the heights, is what Paul says. And what I want to encourage us even right now is would you just take a moment, just in the service, just to realize that even if you're going through something hard, even though you are going through something really lonely, would you clearly have the right doctrine to say, you and I deserve far worse, but it is the kindness and the goodness of God uh, roaming around us, caring for us, loving us in such a way that you and I are here in this space. It's not by our work. It's not by our talent. It's not by our goodness or obedience. It's all grace. And in fact, what you are going through today, even if it's really, really challenging, is far better than hell. Amen? Amen. It is. You know, your worst day here on earth is far better than the best day in hell. And this is a perspective that Jonathan Edwards had, and this is a perspective that we could have, and that was shaped the way we go about our day. So stare at his grace. Here's the second thing that we should stare at. Stare at God's attributes, his attributes. You know, we talked about it. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing, which means he's all-wise, and he knows how your affairs should go down. You know, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere, which means even in your trials, uh, he's there with you. You know, sometimes the loneliest times that you could experience is when you think you're going through a hard time. 
Isn't that true? Whether you're at a hospital, whether it be up at night, in the middle of the night when everybody else is sleeping, you're like, gosh, I feel really lonely right now. And yet, because he's omnipresent, he's there with you. You're not alone. And he's omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful, and he will use all of his knowledge, his power, and his presence for the glory of himself and for your good and for my good. This is what God is doing. He's applying all of his omnis to us so that we would see him as glorious as he is. He will show us how good he is. And he's applying those things even now. And the serpent, remember what he says? He's trying to trick us to say, God doesn't know. You should know. You should want the omnis. And so do you see the connection between the original sin in Genesis 3 to our daily sins, daily sins of ours is just a momentary relapse of the original sin that goes on and on again. And so James points out here, the only reason why we take matters into our own hands is because we don't believe that God is all-powerful and loving. But what if we stared at his attributes? What if we recognized him? This is what we must stare at. Now, I want to give you a caveat here not to say, hey, if you know some people that are struggling, don't just tell them callously, insensitively, you know what, just stare at God's attributes, man, no worries, hakuna matata. You know, don't say that. You could be sensitive. You could be grieving with them, come alongside them. But here's my point. We should care, we should plan, but we should never do it at the expense of trusting God first, amen? Amen. We should trust God first, if the Lord wills. Remember when the Israelites were in the wilderness of God? And they were in the wilderness because God provided that wilderness, and they were lost. And what does God do? God provides, right, by floating manna from the sky. And they would eat, and they would have provision. And this is what God was doing. He was correcting us. He was training us. And remember his instruction? He says, only gather what you could eat for that day. Don't be a hoard. Don't, don't take more. Don't, don't, don't say, well, what if he doesn't show up tomorrow? Well, I better get some for tomorrow just in case as an insurance. Remember? And this is, this is what God is saying. Like, that's a direct violation of not trusting me. I'm saying, I will give you daily bread. And you know, you and I are just like the Israelites. Remember the stupidity we displayed in hoarding toilet paper? Remember that? Remember that season? We're like, toilet paper? I mean, it wasn't even food. We're hoarding toilet paper to wipe our you-know-what. I mean, what? We're such fools. We're just like the Israelites. What does God say? Hey, listen, that food, if you hoard it and you take some more than what you could consume that day, it's going to rot. Remember that? And what the Lord is telling us today is, I need you to trust me. I want you to look at my character. I am your provider. I am in control. I know all things. I know things better than you could ever scheme up for yourself. Would you remember me? And so could I just give you a practical exercise to do today? As you are tempted to pray for all the things that you are in need, could I first encourage you, maybe this week, instead of, Bending to the desires of praying for things that you need, just pray God's attributes. Just pray his character only. And this is how it goes. You basically pray, God, you are omniscient. You know all things. I don't. But you know all things. You know the past. You know my present. You know my deepest secrets. And you know my deepest fears. And you know what's ahead of me. I could trust you but you're also omnipotent. You have the power to do something about it. And I don't. You are powerful. You are good. You are kind. You are wise. You are just. You know all things. And this is what praying his attributes look like. And what that does is that it gets us from staring at worry and gets us to stare at his worth. See, when we stare at his worth and his attributes, then somehow our hearts are filled with the kind of assurance and groundedness that you and I need today. Will you trust yourself or will you trust God? Does the wind and the waves know your name? They know his. Will you trust him? Here's the third thing that you and I could stare at. Stare at God's assurance. 
Yes, stare at his grace, stare at his attributes. But would you stare at God's assurance here? Now, you may believe today that God is all-powerful, that he's all-knowing, that he's omnipresent everywhere. And so you, you are sure of these things, but you're like, Ryan, but how do I know God's going to use all of his omnis to my benefit? How do I know that? How do I know? How, how could I be assured that he's going to use all that for me and for my good? After all, look at what verse 14 says. What is your life? All you are, a, it's just a mist that appears for a little time, then it vanishes. And this verse gives me no assurance whatsoever because I'm all but a mist. So where does my assurance come from? Well, you realize that though you and I are a mist for a little time, you know, you and I, for some reason, don't vanish. Why? And that we'll never vanish? Why? Here's why. And you know why. Because God sent his son to become a mist for us. A mist. What is a mist? Nothing. Do you remember Philippians 2? Jesus says, I, I've come as a servant, and I, I come in the appearance of nothing. That's what he says. I'm, I'm, I'm dropping all of my omnis down. I'm laying it aside so that I could be a mist for you so that one day you will be a solid adopted children through Christ. So on the cross, instead of us becoming mist, he became a mist for us. Instead of us being forgotten, and remember we forget God? Well, God forgot Jesus. Remember he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because in the moment, God was treating Jesus as if he had lived your life so that now he could treat us, me and you, as if we had lived Jesus' life. And because of this grace of the gospel, we are no longer a mist, but forever adopted children of God. And what happens, mists that are in the hands of God, they are preserved forever. They are preserved forever. And this is why God says in Isaiah 49, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion for the son of her womb? The, the, it's a rhetorical question. You're like, how could a mother ever forget about her child? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. This is what God says, that he's engraved every single one of us in the palm of his hands. Now, this is rather quite significant that he's engraved us in the palm of his hands because at the end of the day, you have to realize this. In the ancient times, you know, there were servants that actually tattooed their master's name on their arms and their hands as allegiance, as devotion to their master. Well, wow, how devoted, how humble. But never a time where the master ever tattooed the name of their servant's hand. That would be preposterous. Like, you're a master. You would actually put, you've seen people put their children's name. I mean, you've never seen a master put tattooing their, the names of their servants, right, on their body. I mean, would that be incredible if a master did? How humble, how loving, how devoted a master would be to do that for a servant. But this verse says, it's not a servant that did that for a master. It's not a master that did it for a servant. But it says, our God, the cosmic, creator of the universe has engraved your name into your hands. Wow, how lovely, how devoted, how humbling, how sweet. Is it? It's not a sweet depiction. In fact, it's a horrible depiction because the word engraved in the Hebrew language is not tattooed, but engraved with a chisel. Do you ever remember a time when there's a chisel that went through somebody's hand. Ah, uh, now you know. It was Christ. It was Christ who hung on the cross. And for six hours, he's in incredible agony and pain, well beyond physically, but emotionally and spiritually, as his father turned his face against him. And as he was receiving all the damnation and condemnation of the world, he was pierced for us marking his hands, engraving your name. And this is the assurance that you and I have. 
when you and I are going through some incredibly hard, lonely times, we should look at Christ's hands. In fact, when he came back after he resurrected, remember the disciples were huddled in their little home, and they were scared, they were uncertain. The most uncertain of all was Thomas. Remember Thomas? He was the doubter. He was a worrywart. And Thomas was worried. He was like, and the disciples, his friends were saying, hey, calm down, chill out. It's going to be all right. He's like, no, it's not. It's not going to be okay. We're cooked. We're done. This mission's over. And Jesus shows up and assures Thomas. Do you remember how? What did Jesus offer Thomas? His hands. Do you remember? He said, Thomas, look at my hands. Your name. This for you. Don't worry. I got you. No matter what you're worried of, no matter what you think you're losing control, Jesus is saying, would you, would you look at my hands? I've engraved your name. I've, I've done this for you. You would have never chosen this, but I chose it for you. This is empirical. It shows you and reminds you every day that you're not alone, that I'm with you. Look at the grace. Look at the attributes. Look at his assurance. Is it so interesting that in the redeemed body of Jesus, when he came back, he still had holes in his hands? Why? You think all of our old scars will still be here when we regenerate into our new redeemed bodies? No, I'm going to get a brand new knee. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to have a full-on six-pack that I never had. It's going to be awesome. Why did Jesus keep the holes in his hands? For our assurance. See, Thomas, see you, I've got you. And you don't have to worry. You just have to stare at me. You have to stare at me. New story, I'm going to leave you with this story so that you could actually remind yourself this week of something that you could repeat over and over again, that you will stare at the right thing. I have a son in this room today. He's my middle son. His name is Brennan. And when he was six, he really had a hard year. He's just going through a lot of stuff, and we're enduring a lot of stuff through him. And I remember when he turned uh, six years old, I decided to not be an Asian dad. I'm just going to, like, just leave the Asian dad aside, and I'm going to take him to a toy store. So I took him to a toy store, and I said, listen, son, you get to pick anything you want in this store. You get to pick anything you want from this store, this brick and mortar, choose anything you want. Sky's the limit as, the, as long as the sky is called 30 bucks. All right, so go ahead and just ch ch pick whatever you want. <laughs> and so the, he goes and, you know, he's always indecisive. He's still kind of indecisive today. And he's like choosing and he doesn't know what to pick. And he's bringing little trinkets to me like, you know, $2, $5 things. I'm like, no, pick something better for yourself. Pick something great. Dad wants to bless you. And so he's spending 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 20, 20, 30, 40, an hour. And he still really had no idea what he wanted to pick. And I was flustered. I'm like, man, you're going to pick something? Because if you don't get a gift, you're going to get a spanking. You know, like, pick something. And he goes, and I'll never forget what he said. He looks at me and says, Daddy, you choose for me because you're a good dad and you always make good choices. I'm like, what? <laughs> you think I'm a good dad? He's like, yeah. And you think I'll make a better choice for you than what you can make for yourself? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, kid, that $30 limit went up to $300. <laughs> Let's go. You know what I mean? I'm like, whatever you want. You want a car right now? You want to go to the dealer? You want like a little sea do a little wave runner? Whatever it is, man, let's go get it. You trust me that much? Listen, here's the phrase that you could say over and over and over again as I've been saying it since that day. God, you're a good dad. And you always make good choices for me. So help me in my unbelief. 
Help me to know that every choice that comes my way, it is your good choice. And that whatever I'm going through is by your grace. Whatever I'm going through, I could stare at your character, your attributes. Whatever I'm going through, I could always be assured that you love me because I know what you did, sending your son to the cross because I see it in his hands. Will you remind yourself that today? And whatever your worries are, I pray that it would dissipate in light of his glorious grace. Let's pray. Christ, in your hands are engravement of our names that we are not forgotten no matter how far we are from you today and there's some people in this room that has walked away from you that have ignored you that are distant from you even now and yet you're not distant from us our our names our our lives engraved in your hands and you love us and you receive us the same christ thank you thank you for dying on the cross Thank you for showing us over and over and over again that we are assured that your character is one of omniscience, omnipresent, omnipotent. You are a mighty, mighty God using all of your powers uh, for your glory and for our good. Help us to see that everything that we're going through is by your grace alone. And as we stare into those things, that all of our worries would just dissipate and grow dim in light of your face and your grace over our lives. And we thank you for that assurance today that you give. May the Holy Spirit penetrate the people of God today in ways that they cannot ever forget this reality in their life. We pray in the matchless name of our King, our Savior, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen.